Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Happy New Year. Get that coffee. We're alive. Once more. We've lived to read through another one. Cool. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Welcome to the five best books that I read in 2022. Ah, uh, yes. Not, not my favorite year. That's all right. All right. So what do we got? Well, first, there's the uh, omitted classic choices. You know, the, uh, the books that have already been spoken about plenty and I have nothing new to say on them really, which, you know, those would be um, Oscar Wilde's A Picture of Dorian Gray, uh, a book about a man who falls in love with his own portrait and uh, sort of becomes, um, how would you put it, narcissistically, vampirically attached to a portrait done of him, which actually ages while he stays the same age, this kind of curse that occurs. Wilde was influenced by Wiesmont, uh, which it's not spoken, but uh, against nature makes an appearance, a cameo in that book. I really enjoyed it. It's a ridiculous, ridiculous story, but uh, definitely worth your time. Hamlet by Shakespeare. Uh, what can I say? A completely chaotic play. Where to even begin? Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, avenging his dead father, who was murdered because of his mother. Unbelievably complex, layered, extremely witty and clever, of course. Kind of a meditation on death and existence, reality and madness. I loved it. Still working through it. Need to reread it. For supplementary material on that one, I recommend Harold Bloom's Hamlet Poem Unlimited, which I've actually reviewed for patrons, link below. It's only not my number one favorite book of the year because it's a classic and an easy guess. So, Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky, the last review I did, uh, made a lot of people upset, but that's okay. I was disappointed in a lot of the novel's stylistic renderings, but, you know, at the same time, even though I thought it was like riddled with cliches and what have you, I did enjoy struggling with uh, Dostoevsky's philosophical ideas. And I do recommend reading the book once because many, many people, obviously, if you look at the comments in the last video, really love that book and are prepared to attack somebody who doesn't like it. So that's okay. I was absolutely ready for that and good for them. You should protect things that you love. I still hate it. And The Stranger by Camus, which is the, uh, the famous French existentialist novel, the story of a very strange man in North Africa who commits a murder uh, and his, uh, his journey basically thereafter to death, you know, his execution. Very odd, odd novel. Beautiful though. Terrific book. One of the best. An amazing demonstration of literary economy. Uh, you know, just how much can be said in so few words. Uh, yeah, the links for all of those reviews are down below as well, if any of those sound interesting to you. Okay, runner-ups for the best books of 2022. Um, let's see. My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moshfeg. Okay, it's about a girl in New York who, after her parents tragically pass away, uh, decides that she's going to um, induce a kind of metamorphosis using um, prescription drugs by using them to sleep for as long as she possibly can, trying to completely eradicate this life that she's totally dissatisfied with as this very pretty girl in New York City working at an art gallery. And uh, <laughs> all of it takes place just before 9-11, at the end of the century. It is a very humorous, cynical, caustic, takedown of modern American big city culture. I thought it was funny as hell. Really looking forward to reading more by Moshfig. Woodcutters by Thomas Bernhard, the Austrian author. Oh God, so scathing, scathing, scathing. Again, like a very cynical um, kind of, uh, what would you call it? Bullet to the head of the bourgeoisie pretentious art culture of Vienna. Uh, all takes place at this dinner party, uh, which is just a complete uh, fiasco. And it's all just the thoughts going through this guy's head about all the people that he knows at the party and uh, who they are and what they do. Yeah, classic Bernhard. If you like The Loser, you'll definitely enjoy this one. Not unlike, you know, the, the narrator from uh, Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground. Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin. A beautiful murder crime love story told in Paris between two men. One of them is kind of on the cusp of getting married and he meets a young bartender in Paris and uh, falls in love with him but he doesn't know how to handle it. You know, he was gonna marry this woman and he doesn't seem to understand himself or what he's doing. And uh, so he has this brief love affair with this, uh, this bartender and it's, uh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful story about two people who are, who are so um, totally unconcerned with the world and entirely focused on their own world, you know, their, their relationship. And uh, everything goes south in, in the worst way possible. Uh, and I won't tell you what happens, but uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful novel. Very tragic. And, uh, you know, all the elements of a, of a uh, crime mystery, you know. Very beautiful atmosphere, you know, mid-20th century Paris. It's great. 
All right, here we go. The best books I read in 2022. Coming in at number five, Leaving Las Vegas by John O'Brien. God help me, if there is ever a book to make you stop drinking, holy hell. But simultaneously, it somehow captures uh, the appeal of drinking, almost on like a philosophical level, which is sacrificing any and all pretense for the joy lived within the moment, particularly with another person. Imbibing poison and carefree self-destruction, that momentarily banishes the reality of suffering brought daily by life and, you know, and, and the knowledge of the inevitable death that we all face. Entirely alone, of course. It's the story of a man, Ben, who has decided, after getting fired from his job, decided definitively to take the remaining money that he has and go to Las Vegas to commit suicide by drinking himself to death. That's it. He is, no pun intended, dead set on this idea. He befriends this prostitute and uh, they hang out for a while before he succumbs to his addiction. A woman on the run from a, an ex-pimp named Sarah. That's the long and short of it. It's an absolutely beautifully written novel. Deeply disturbing, somehow very American, and somehow with like all the deaths of despair going on right now, something that I feel is more, um, just hits closer to home than ever. I mean, we, I mean, you don't have to look too far to find somebody in your circle of friends or family who either has or knows somebody who's OD'd uh, or has died of alcoholism or just like, what are they, like, who knows, drug addiction, fentanyl, heroin, these days, like pills, you know, it's everywhere, especially with all the events in the last few years. So yeah, it's, it's a fucked up book, but it's beautiful. Fine literature from a tormented soul, John O'Brien, who committed suicide at the age of 34, two weeks after he was informed that this was actually going to be adapted into a film. This was his first novel. He didn't even live to see the adaptation with Nicolas Cage. Cage won the Academy Award for his performance in that one. Terrible. O'Brien's father said that the book, this book, was his suicide note. So, dark, but excellent. And you know, the interesting thing is that it's actually not a really depressing novel. You actually, it's, it's strange to say, but you know, you, you kind of feel, you just sort of feel, at least I came away from it feeling, just kind of like feeling happy that these two characters met each other before he died, you know? I mean, it, it was really like, you just like that there was at least one moment of, of kind of uh, peace or something as close to it as possible in their lives before, uh, you know, before the journey back into infinity or whatever. The only other novel I can think of that captures um, the spirit of drinking, that is, you know, like true alcoholism in the same manner would be Havoc by the Danish author uh, Tom Christensen and, and also um, the British author Malcolm Lowry's uh, Under the Volcano. So there's two more to round out your alcoholic literature trio homework or whatever. Please drink responsibly, everyone. Number four, The Quiet American by Graham Greene. The perfect expat thriller travel novel. Phenomenal. Burdain was a fan of this one. In my review, I described it as an expat novel, a murder mystery, and also a kind of anti-war novel. It's about an Englishman, a, a, a fellow working as a journalist in uh, Saigon named Thomas Fowler in 1950s Vietnam, right at the start of the Vietnam War, I believe. So it's, uh, so it's French occupied Vietnam. And this young, naive, patriotic, quiet American who presents a stunning contrast to the jaded, aging Fowler who has relegated himself to the joys of opium and his uh, much younger mistress, Fuong, whom he can't marry because of his uh, Catholic wife, whom he's left behind but refuses to divorce him. Pyle, this American, just uh, waltzes right in and starts encroaching on his life of peace and trying to steal his woman because he can actually marry and support her. Uh, his dad's like rich and blah, blah, blah. So Pyle, this uh, idealistic, naive American, seems to be rushing right in to destroy everything that Thomas loves, including the country he inhabits. So when the quiet American turns up dead in the beginning of the novel, who did it? Gorgeous atmosphere and spectacular economical prose. I emphatically recommend it, definitely. Number three, The Tartar Step by Dino Buzzati. Truly depressing, but in a cosmically beautiful uh, Tarkovskian Bergman sort of way. A beautiful meditative novel about the fact that all of us die alone. And you see the coffee's kicking in now. And, and, not only do we die alone, but we often, but we often What die the alone fuck is going on with my audio? Do, does anybody know what this is? I, are there any audio files out there in the audience? Because I do not understand why this crackling keep, keeps coming in and out of my Sennheiser love here. I'm about to chuck this thing out the fucking window. But we often die alone waiting for something to happen that we didn't set out to accomplish with the time that we had. We were thinking about it, but we didn't do it. Why? It's a great question. Why did we waste our time?
because we're all wasting our time. Everybody's wasting their time. The book is about the fact that literally all of us are wasting our lives, all of us. So nothing's gonna change when I say that, but that's what the book is about and it's amazing. It's not a waste of your time to read that book. It's a book about the lives that all of us waste, waiting, hoping for something to happen instead of taking action. Giovanni Drogo is a young man from a northern Italian town who travels out of the city to do his military service at this isolated fortress on the edge of a, of a large steppe, like a desert plain in the mountains. Nothing really happens at this fortress in the mountains, except you have all of these soldiers waiting around for this rumored army of Tartars to suddenly appear on the steppe. And then when they appear, they'll realize, ah, they're invading. You know, grab your guns, we're going to war with the Tartar army. Our day of meaning has finally come. <laughs> And they can all go and die in battle or whatever, you know? But at least something will happen. They'll be able to use their military knowledge or their training or whatever they've been doing out there in this fortress for God knows how long. Whether they live or die, their lives will have meaning or something. But that hasn't happened yet. So, you know, every day they just go out there and look out on the step from the fort, right? And, uh, yeah. Go to bed, wake up, do it again. <laughs> So initially repelled by his impression of the fort, he's like looking around, he's like, what the hell is this? Drogo intends to return, you know, to go back to town and uh, get a life. But then he comes under the hypnotic spell of the fort, right? There's something addictive about it. This, uh, this possibility, this chance of something happening, something, who knows what, right? It could be big. <laughs> An exceptional book, uh, deeply disturbing, uh, terrifying, really. But also, you know, uh, with the ending, wonderful. Number two, The Passenger slash Stella Maris from Cormac McCarthy. Uh, this is two books, but uh, you know, it's the same story, so I figured just one entry. This pair of novels from Cormac McCarthy are the first things he's published in 16 years. At 89 years old, he's got more fire in him than the vast majority of young authors out there these days. This is a very strange, strange story about a brother and sister who are in love with each other and whose father was one of the men responsible for the creation of the atomic bomb. The first novel, The Passenger, is from the brother's perspective, Bobby Western. He's working as a salvage diver in New Orleans, and it's basically composed of a lot of the conversations he has with people he knows, friends of his, and uh, he's this man who's just essentially doomed. There's no other way to say it. He's basically acquiesced to a, a life. Uh, he's just playing it out at this point. His sister has committed suicide, and uh, it's, his life is, for all intents and purposes, over. You know, and in a way he's basically given up on finding true love or happiness again and uh, has kind of just resigned himself to waiting for death and taking these jobs that he's afraid to do but might kill him. So it's, it's a hell of a book. And then Stella Maris is from the perspective of Alicia Western, his sister, and takes place in a mental hospital in Wisconsin. And the book is basically composed of one long conversation between her and a psychiatrist that she's working with. And that's it. The passenger is filled with all these appearances of these hallucinations of Alicia's as she's mentally ill. She's this math prodigy, but is clearly mentally ill. So she experiences these extremely vivid, strange, um, humorous hallucinations, which frequently appear in the novel. And I still have not figured out what exactly is going on in the narrative. There's, there's, it's a total puzzle. It's a bewildering experience with layers of hidden gems. Definitely worth rereading. So it's really strange for McCarthy. It's it's um, unusually silly in a lot of places. Oh, there's a lot of humor with the hallucinations in particular. But uh, anyways, yeah, these books go by in a flash. I mean, they read far faster than the majority of books I've read. I imagine it's because most of the narrative, even in The Passenger, is composed of conversations with fascinating people about fascinating subjects. Uh, and they, and these are, these are all, you know, McCarthy's obsessions. Math, physics, philosophy, life, death, uh, God, you know, uh, the big ones, the heavy hitting stuff. I loved them. I'm just gonna stop there if the initial plot sounds compelling to you. I highly suggest you pick them up and just get in there. I liked them much more than The Road. Contrary maybe to your impression, they're, they're far less bleak, actually. Um, nevertheless, they're, they're totally devastating. Especially Stella Maris, the conversation with Alicia. That's, that's a tough one. I was unhappy at their length, at how short they are. And they're not short, you know, so... Um, yeah, it was a displeasure to stop reading them. And now, drum roll please. The best book that I read in 2022 was Patricia Highsmith's The Talented Mr. Ripley. Oh my God. 
This book is better than a European vacation. This, this book, let's talk about this book. I just love this damn thing, what can I say? Again, it was a displeasure to stop reading the story. I figured that's a sign, you know? Would you believe it if I told you that a certain literary psychopath is more preferable to hang out with than 99% of humanity? I myself would have been pretty skeptical of that statement. Then I was introduced to Tom Ripley, and I've never been the same. The talented Mr. Ripley is the answer to the question, what if a young man murdered another young man and usurped his identity and got away with it? That is the premise. The setting is beautiful mid 20th century Italy. With our ambitious psychopathic protagonist traveling from city to city, weaving and dodging the authorities and the associates of the man he murdered, Dickie Greenleaf. He was sent to Italy by Dickie's parents back in New York to bring back their son. But instead, you know, when he meets their son, uh, he falls in love with him, in a way, kind of. And uh, until he realizes that the, uh, the love will never, never be reciprocated. And not only that, um, you know, after initially befriending him, you know, Dickie, under the influence of uh, his lover Marge, um, turns kind of nasty to Tom. Like they're initially friends, they're palling around, they're having a good time, but then he suspects that Tom is actually gay, which Tom is, and Marge is jealous, and uh, so their relationship sours. So you know, that's basically the end of that for Tom. But instead of going back to his small time existence in New York, Tom decides he's going to take the biggest risk imaginable, and it pays off. Tom is a con man. He was scamming people back in New York, pretending to be the IRS just for fun, right? Just, to, just as practice. He's a complete sociopath. Um, he feels guilty, not for lying to people, but when he tells the truth. He's a very strange man. He's not a good guy at all, but he's somehow always the underdog. And you always kind of want him to win. I don't know why, it's, it's remarkable. <laughs> I mean, he's totally evil, but uh, we love him. Why? I mean, because he's a natural. There's a disturbing charm that Highsmith imbues Ripley with. He's evil, yet we love him. He's totally in his element. It's not forced. He is truly a born con man. He's like uh, gifted with impersonations. Uh, he's methodical, he's analytical. He is really sharp, always thinking one step ahead. The book is like watching a, a musician's defining moment on stage or something. He's a showman, right? He's a performer. This is a masterful performance by an ambitious con artist. The complex part of the novel is when he has to switch back and forth from Tom Ripley to Dickie Greenleaf to escape. Yeah, it's very odd. He remains somehow the underdog throughout the novel, in spite of what he does. Perhaps it's because his victim was rich and bored and rather snotty to him, and Ripley has had to risk his skin to get where he is, and was also sincere in his friendship and admiration. This is the story of uh, an understandable revenge. Not sympathetic, but we can clearly see his motivation. I don't know, it's fascinating. I love the character of Tom Ripley. I thought Highsmith is beyond genius. I don't know how Highsmith did it, but it's worth studying. Better than food. The best thing I've read this year, definitely. All right, <sighs> coffee time. For those of you who are new, thank you very much for stopping by watching. I take the names of all the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show. I place their names in this mason jar. And for each review I do, I pull out a name and whoever's name I pull out shall be sent a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing plus a bag of coffee, Rosa Bayer's Truly. I roast coffee as a hobby and it's delicious. If you would like to kindly support the show and get in on that, you can click on the link below or go to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and donate $5 or more per video. And I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. If you donate a dollar or more on Patreon, you'll get all these reviews ad free, plus the cool stuff listed below. So please check it out. Thanks a bunch. Thank you very much to all the patrons and best of luck. Okay, here we go. Eugene, Eugene C. Thank you very much, Eugene, and happy new year. You're going to receive whichever book you prefer from this list plus a bag of delicious coffee, and I hope you love both. Cheers. Well, I hope your 2023 is a lot better than my 2022. I don't know, it doesn't seem like we're out of the woods yet, so prepare for a lot more pain. Put on your pain hat. Ready. Please subscribe if you have not already, and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this, and always remember, bring a book wherever you go. Hope you love those books as much as I did. Take care of yourselves, have a great night, talk to you soon. Ciao.